This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making for Canadians. We are hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore, Portfolio Managers at PWL Capital. So this week, coming to life is a great idea that you had, which is something um, that we pulled together, that you pulled together, focusing on a single topic. So tell us where the idea came from. Well, we've we've done lots of episodes where where you and I focus on a single topic, but we've also had lots of conversations with experts in various on various topics. Uh, but one of the concerns that I have as the library of our content increases is that if somebody wants to reference the our, the podcast to learn about a topic, like if they want to learn about the the four percent rule, which is what we're going to talk about in this episode, it's dispersed across many many episodes. Um, so we've produced all of this high quality, we think anyway, information in, in conversation with some of the world's leading experts on various topics. But if you want to learn about one of those topics, it's, it's not so easy to index the content to do so. Uh, it isn't. And, and, and also when you go through the, the, the pieces that you pull together, the audio clips that you pull together, the story really becomes richer when you put it all together because they often add different um, ideas to someone else's ideas. Yeah. So we, we haven't explained the format, the, 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 this new format that we're piloting it. So we'll explain what it is. Uh, so we, we've taken, like I mentioned for the 4% rule, we've taken that topic and we've gone through all of our existing catalog of content and said, who, who have we had the most meaningful, impactful conversations with on the specific topic of the 4% rule? Right. And, and then we've compiled those together into a single episode with additional commentary from you and I in between each clip. Uh, and our, our hope is to do this for other topics in the future, this, this just being the, the, first, the first one. Uh, we've experimented with different formats a couple times as we've progressed with the podcast, and this is our, our first new uh, experiment in quite a while. So we, we do hope that people find it useful. It's kind of like our year review episodes that we've done a couple of times, but we are going to skip this week, you know, any sort of book review, news of the week, other investment topics, as well as bad advice of the week. So this is a standalone and others in the future will be standalone on single topics. Yep. All right. So should we, should we jump into the, the first comprehensive overview episode as we're calling them? Let's go. Welcome to episode 164 of the Rational Reminder podcast. Uh, today we're doing a comprehensive overview of the 4% rule. So we, th- this is a spending rule that, that we've, we've talked about with s- some of, I mean, the, the world's leading experts on, on the topic. Uh, we've talked to Bill Bengen, who created the 4% rule. So, I mean, who, who better to uh, <laughs> ex- explain what it is? Literally, Literally the, the guy. Yeah, uh, we've talked to Wade Fow, who's one of the, the world's leading retirement researchers. Uh, he's a professor of retirement income at the American College of Financial Services. Uh, we've talked to Moshe Malevsky about the four percent rule. He teaches undergrad, graduate, and doctoral students courses on wealth management, investments, insurance, pensions, and retirement planning at York University. And he's written a ton of books on retirement income. So, Great uh, books, must yeah. read books. Great books, and and his thoughts on the four percent rule were were fantastic. Uh, we talked to Michael Kitzes, who's the head of planning strategy at Buckingham, which is a large uh, wealth management firm in the in the United States. Uh, Fred Vatis, who's a former actuary and the author of multiple books on retirement income. Uh, and to balance it all out, all out, we had a conversation with Scott Rickens, who is the creator of of the documentary Playing with with Fire. So I mean, when you think about okay, I want to sit down and learn about the four percent <laughs> rule. I, I cannot imagine. Anybody else that you would maybe add to that roster to make it better? Um, may, maybe, maybe uh, Big Earn, the guys, that, the guy that writes the Early Retirement Now blog. He, yeah, he, he could he could be in this roster too. Um, but I, I think what we have is is pretty great. So to start, because we we haven't explained what it is yet, uh, to explain what the four percent rule is, we're going to go to a clip from our conversation with Bill Bengen, who again is the creator of the 4% rule. I, I, I can't think of anyone better to describe <laughs> what the 4% rule is. He was such a nice guy too. Bill Bengen, it's with great pleasure that we welcome you to the Rash Reminder podcast. Thanks, appreciate the invitation, great to be here. Yeah, we're, we're so happy to have you. 
So in 1994, your analysis in determining withdrawal rates using historical data, I think it's safe to say changed the way people think about retirement planning. And your finding is often quoted as the 4% rule. Can you describe what your 1994 research finding was? Yeah, your question made me go back and take a look at my original paper. And when I reread it, I, I did so with a, quite a few smiles because <laughs> 27 years ago, knowledge has advanced a lot since then. But my basic findings were still reasonably you know, acceptable in today's uh, world that uh, if you were withdrawing during retirement from a tax deferred account, and you expect to live for 30 years and you wanted your money to live for 30 years, uh, a 4% uh, withdrawal rate the first year and then increasing for inflation each year after that uh, would uh, has always worked historically. And that was just using two asset classes. That was using large cap stocks and intermediate term treasuries. Uh, and the asset allocation uh, that came out of that was about a 50-50. Turned out to be optimal for that. Okay, so Bengen modeled withdrawal starting as a percentage of the portfolio and then increasing with inflation each year. So the result being a constant inflation adjusted spending. And then he tested withdrawals starting each calendar year from 26 to 1976, so 50 years, and observed how long the portfolio lasted at each starting point. So for 30 year portfolio, half stock, half bonds, he found that the 4% withdrawal rate was always sustainable. So that's the key takeaway. Yeah, and then uh, when Bengen came out with his paper, there was another paper in 1998, uh, Retirement Savings, Choosing a Withdrawal Rate That Is Sustainable by Cooley, Hubbard, and Walls. And that paper is commonly referred to in the financial independence retirement re retire early community as the Trinity Study. And so these two papers together uh, kind of solidified this concept that 4% is a safe withdrawal rate. And the, the Trinity study is where people get the idea that 4% was safe 95% uh, of the time in the, in the historical data. Now, there are uh, some, some really important points that, that I've, I've expressed in, in YouTube videos and on our podcast uh, regarding the 4% rule. It, it's, it's based in Bengen's research on a 30-year withdrawal uh, period, and it's in the historical data. Uh, it, it's it's based on a, a 30 to 65 year old investor, and then Bengen said that he added roughly 10 years onto normal life expectancy to account mm -hmm. for longevity risk. But the key here, we're talking about a 30 year uh, withdrawal period, and uh, particularly when we're talking about early retirees, it's probably ho hopefully going to be a longer than a, a 30 year withdrawal. Uh, if you extend that period, so say we looked at 40 year periods for withdrawals. The four percent repeating the four percent rule as it was originally analyzed, uh, the success rate drops to around eighty-seven percent, which is uh, fascinating. It's kind of counterintuitive. Why? Just because you think longer periods of time smooths up more of the bumps, right? But the success rate goes down with longer periods of time. Everyone's told have an investment horizon that's a long period of time. Be patient. Your returns might even out. You you might be more likely to get the average return over a longer period of time. Um, but I think that the, the challenge is with the sequence of returns, which Correct. is one of the things that, that this, the whole concept of the 4% rule uh, and, and what is a safe withdrawal rate, answering that question started with, uh, well, just no, nobody knew. Nobody had tested empirically and you didn't know based on the sequence of returns that you were going to get, you didn't know how much you could actually spend. So that's why this was a breakthrough. And mm -hmm. when we talked to Bill Bengen, he explained to us why, uh, why, why he thought it became so, so popular. Um, but th there are definitely still, still, uh, shortcomings. And so anyway, I, I mentioned some of the issues. There are other ones like the fact that this uses us data when there are many other countries in, in the world that have yeah. also had stock return histories, uh, wh where I got that information. Like when I did my, my YouTube videos on this topic, it all came from reading, uh, one of Wade Fowles books on, retirement spending where he picked apart the 4% rule. And he was actually one of the first people, the first person to publish research using international data to say, hey, th this thing hasn't actually worked if you look at pretty much anywhere except for the US and Canada and New Zealand or the other ones where it did work. So we're going to now play a clip from our conversation with Wade Fowle uh, to, to talk about some of the issues 
around the 4% rule. When I read your book, How Much Can I Spend in Retirement, your research on the 4% rule that you wrote about in that book was, to me at the time, totally mind-blowing. I know you just mentioned it briefly, but can you expand a little bit on what you found about the 4% rule and how it probably isn't the best thing to be using? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I got my start in all this. I had a different data set. The 4% rule is based on US historical market returns. And I had global market returns for 20 different countries and looked at, did the 4% rule work in other countries? Just found that it worked in the US and Canada, but not in the other 18 countries in the data set. And if you put all the international data together with a 50-50 allocation, which is kind of a baseline for this research, the 4% rule worked about 68% of the time around the world. And if you wanted a withdrawal rate that worked 90% of the time around the world, you had to drop it down to 2.8%. And so I thought that was pretty compelling that we shouldn't just base things on kind of U.S. 20th century market returns when the U.S. had such a great century, as well as Canada. But if you look at a more typical international experience, the 4% rule didn't work as well. I would get pushback on this, though, that people just, especially like in the U.S. context, well, if we live and invest in the U.S., who cares about other country market returns. But then that just led to all these other issues, the the low interest rate issue that we just discussed. It's going to lower returns, lower sustainable spending. The idea that the 4% rule is calibrated to 30 years, but if you're planning for longer than 30 years of retirement, you need to look at a lower withdrawal rate. The idea that the 4% rule assumes investors earn the indexed market returns. So there's no investment expenses. There's no other misbehavior. They have to, the 4% rule calls for a 50 to 75% stock allocation, which is on the aggressive side. And people have to really stick to that and not panic and never misbehave. They have to follow this perfectly rational investor type of logic. So if you take a haircut off of the returns for any of these types of issues, as well, I should say, as taxes, the the 4% rule ignores taxes. So it's fine if you have some sort of tax-deferred account where you're paying taxes out of the 4%, but in any sort of taxable account where you have to pay taxes on an ongoing basis on interest and dividends and so forth, there's no 4% rule with that either. So that really just led to this idea that we have to look beyond the simple rule of thumb like the 4% rule to think about what is a sustainable spending strategy for retirees. So that information from Wade Fow, in my mind, kills the 4% rule. And it no did. Kidding. Like when, when I first read Wade's book, like I mentioned before, I, it was like, okay, well, they, they, there's no counter argument uh, that, that I can think of. And, and why, why would you only look at a 30-year sample, a 30-year retirement period uh, using only US stocks to conclude that this is a, a safe withdrawal rate while ignoring the, the international data? There's also the question of whether things are different today. High stock valuations, low bond yields. I mean, it's, it's a whole different era than the time period that that Bill looked at. Yeah. So this this is exactly what we talked to Fred Vitis about. So another very common question, Fred, that we all get asked often relates to the rule of thumb about the four percent spending rule, which is you can safely withdraw four percent of your portfolio in the starting year, then adjust it for inflation thereafter. So is four percent a safe withdrawal rate? Uh, it might have been a safe withdrawal rate at one point in time. Um, back in the 1990s, you look at, uh, at Government of Canada bonds and real return bonds, and the, the real return, that is after inflation, would have been about 4%, 5%. Uh, when you look at bonds today, the real return is 0%. So if you're going to get a four, so you need to get a, a real return of four percent for the four percent rule to make some some sense, and you're not getting it from bonds. So you have to be getting it from stocks. But even even the, the real return expected on stocks is not going to be four percent anymore, as it has been historically. So you ha- have a problem doing it. So here's the thing. I once again I, I've done some Monte Carlo simulations on this, and uh, where people have used the four percent rule, but then they had bad investment returns. So by bad, I mean their returns track the fifth percentile um, uh, mark every year. You might say, well, that's not going to happen. But yes, it can happen. By definition, it's going to happen one time in 20. And if that ends up happening, then you're going to find that your money will run out uh, by use, by applying the 4% rule. Um, it, it isn't actually a safe rule to be following on, uh, at least not, not blindly. You'll have to actually start curtailing your spending if you find that that uh, your actual investment returns have been nowhere close to what you thought they were going to be. 
So I don't actually endorse the 4% rule. If you're going to use any rule at all, I would simply do the, uh, the minimum uh, uh, withdrawals required under the RIF rules. Okay, so Fred alluded to an important concept that the 4% rule doesn't address, which was Bangin's research was based on these constant inflation-adjusted withdrawals, which may not make a whole lot of sense. So, of course, for those who listen to that episode, we talked to Moja Molevsky about the importance of having flexibility in retirement spending. I think that was one of the most um, perhaps challenging times that we've ever had in an interview. Yeah, motion, motion was tough. And and for anybody wondering, <laughs> I, yes, I did feel like a child when Professor Malevsky was questioning me about the 4% rule. He was so good, so <laughs> poignant on that, on that point. And this is such a great, great part of that interview. Can you talk about how important it is that retirees have some sort of dynamic or flexible spending strategy? So, I mean, it, to me, it's almost tautological. I, I'm, I'm surprised I have to explain to people how important flexibility is. Like, you know, you should be flexible. No, really, I shouldn't just tie myself to the mastheads and just go. <laughs> no, go. Of course, you need flexibility. So the, the idea of a spending rule, and I want to be very careful here, the, the idea of picking a spending rate at the age of 65 and sticking to that spending rate for the rest of your life, no matter what happens, I mean, it, it, it is ridiculous. It, it, and it should sound ridiculous once it's properly explained. So obviously you have to be flexible and you have to adapt to what's happening in the market. So the intelligent approach to spending is, you know, my portfolio is down 10%. How much should I adjust my spending? That's the intelligent approach. You know, the markets have been up very strongly. I'm thinking I can probably withdraw a bit more. How do I adjust my, my spending? Markets are up 30%. Can I adjust my spending 30%? No, 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 no. You need a reserve. Vice versa in the other direction. You know, markets are down 20%. Should I reduce my spending 20%? Uh, no, you don't have to because there should be a reserve built in there. So the, obviously you have to adjust and it has to be dynamic. But to stick to a particular percentage and say, well, no matter what, we're going to continue to withdraw that percentage for the rest of my life as long as I live. I don't even know why you know, we continue to, to push back against it. But uh, to answer your question, Cameron, absolutely flexibility is important. So when you when you say that in the book, you're, you're, you're comparing something like that with the the rules of thumb in financial planning is that things like the four yeah. percent rule i'm sorry the what the four percent rule never heard of it what's the four percent rule <laughs> okay perfect no no i'm serious you d explain to me what the four percent rule is because everybody has their own version of it it's like in okay, the eye okay, of the okay. beholder. what's your version of the four percent rule okay so the, as I understand the genesis of the 4% rule, it came from a guy named William Bengen in, I think, a 1992 or 1994 paper where he showed that you could have sustainably spent in the, in the worst 30-year period in U.S. market history, you could have sustainably spent 4% of, of uh, a portfolio of U.S. stocks and bonds without running out of money. Now, to be clear, th this is a, a rule that Cameron and I have bashed, picked apart, explained why it doesn't make a whole lot of sense many times in the podcast uh, but hear, hearing your thoughts, I guess we kind of already heard them. But if you have any specific commentary to my definition of the 4% rule, that would be... Uh... Benjamin, to be honest, you didn't really describe the 4% rule. So let me, let, let me, let me break it down. So I come to you with a million dollars yes. and I say, hey, hey, Benjamin, uh, I've heard of this thing called the 4% rule. What does it mean? How much can I spend this year? Yeah. So it, it's 4% it's of the million. Probably okay, broken so how up much would that? How much would that be this year? Uh, of the million dollars? Yeah. Well, we're starting with forty thousand dollars in the first year, four percent of, okay. of a million. Uh, and, and, what, and what do I do next year, Benjamin? I want to follow this thing called the four percent rule. What should I do next year? So, based on Bill Bengen's definition, we're going to increase that amount by inflation, that dollar amount, that forty thousand by inflation or or deflation, the following year, and then follow okay. that. And then, what do I do in two years from now? Uh, the same, the same procedure, and rinse and repeat. Okay. And what if the market, you know, doubles in the next year? What do I do? This is one of the issues. We maintain the the same the same path. And and if the market goes down 50%, what do I do? Same same thing. Yeah. See, it's, and and I find that when you sort of break it down like that, you don't have to have a deep conversation about the 4% rule. People nod and say, "Yeah, that really does sound stupid." I would tend to agree with you. I I, I like <laughs> I like the way that you picked it apart though. <laughs> uh okay 
You know, look, I I, I got to be honest. So, you know, I, I was scra look, I've been doing this for a while now. I've been teaching for quite a while. And, you know, I remember when this thing caught on and I'm like, oh, man, that doesn't have legs. They're going to forget about that faster than yesterday's newspaper. Uh, and here we are 25 years later and it's like a tsunami. I mean, it's crushed me. I, I, you know, I can't even, you know, anywhere I go, we use the 4% rule. Um, so what I've done is I, I actually have implemented into my curriculum in the MBA program at the Schulich School. I teach a course on retirement income models and I have an entire week. I mean, that's three hours of a you know 12 week course dedicated to the 4% rule. And, uh, you know, I want you to quantify the risks of the 4%. And does it make sense to you? And would an economist advocate for it? And what are the problems? And they got to write an essay on it. So, you know, hopefully the 40 students that graduate from my class will just shake their head and say, there's no damn way I'm ever doing that thing. But who knows, you know? Well, that was certainly clear from Moja, wasn't it? He, he definitely knows how to <laughs> get, get his point across. <laughs> Uh, now, on variable spending strategies, that is one of the things that we spoke extensively to uh, Michael Kitsis about. So we're going to go to a clip with him where he talks about some of the uh, other, other strategies other than constant inflation adjusted spending that retirees may want to consider. One of the ways that people can deal with that is with variable spending as opposed to spending a straight line, including when markets are down, obviously. C can you talk about some of your favorite variable spending rules? Yeah, so it's it's interesting when you think about the ways that you can deal with this. As I I kind of overgeneralize a little, there's there's sort of two slash three ways that we can deal with this. Uh, the first, and we may talk about it more later, is like I can change stuff in the portfolio, right? I can risk manage, make adjustments, maybe buy and invest in different things, maybe invest more tactically as I'm going. Like I can change the portfolio in response to the markets to try to manage this. Option two is I can change what I'm spending in the first place to deal with this, right? The, it's sort of the proverbial, like when times get tough, we'll tighten our belts a little bit. Now, what we find from the variable spending end in particular is that there really are a couple of different ways that you can that you can go about this. And, and even some of the find some of the sort of rules of thumb that people think about as a way to deal with this aren't aren't actually good ways to deal with this. So the most straightforward way to do this, frankly, is we just spend really conservatively. We spend so conservatively, I think if something, even if something bad happens, we'll weather the storm. And if the worst case scenario is if bad stuff happens, I'll call you in a couple of years and tell you you can spend more. Which for some people, like, great. You know, spending cut, bad. Spending raise, good. So just tell me how far I got to ratchet down to be at a safe baseline level and we'll figure out how to ratchet up later if and when the markets deal that to us. And, and broadly speaking, that's a whole body of research called safe withdrawal rates. We generally find this number around 4% of the starting balance. So like $20,000 per every half million, $40,000 per every million. You take that number, you adjust it for inflation. And even when crazy stuff happens, markets tend to average out in enough time that you have enough left for when the recovery finally shows up. So option one is sort of, it's not really a variable spending rule, but it's a like, be so conservative, you won't have to vary, at least to the downside. And you only have to make upside decisions when you get there. And you can even create, you know, sort of straightforward safety margin rules. I call these ratcheting rules. Like, look, if your portfolio ever gets up 50% from where you started, you have built enough of a margin that even if there's a pullback, you're still so far ahead, you can have a raise. So if you get a, up 50% from where you started, take a 10% raise. Every three years, we'll check in. If you're still that far ahead, keep taking raises as long as you've got your safety margin. So one version is spend conservatively, ratchet higher as we go, but try to keep it conservative enough that if bad stuff happens, I don't have to cut my livestock because I don't like cutting my livestock. The second version of this are what I call uh, guardrails. Uh, some people also call these decision rule approaches. Think, think kind of an if this, then that approach to how we're going to handle it. Um, I, I like to explain this to people as, uh, cause I've got little kids, uh, think bumper lanes at the bowling alley. We have, we have them in the U S I'm presuming this is a phenomenon in Canada as well. Uh, you know, I, I've got three little ones. And so when we take them bowling, uh, these little like bumpers come up 
on the lanes so that the ball can't go into the gutter. When I was young, they actually had like giant inflatable tubes they put in there. <laughs> now it's all electronics. So these like little gate barriers come up and block the block off the gutters. And then the bumpers go down when the adults go, unless the adults want to be conservative. And then you get the bumpers on the adult lanes as well. So when my daughter goes to bowl the ball in a bumper lane, right? One of two things happens. She either rolls the ball fairly straight down the line. It rolls all the way down. It hits the pin. She gets all excited and does her little victory dance. Or she rolls the ball slightly askew. It drifts off to the side, heads towards the gutter, hits the bumper, bounces off the bumper, goes back into the middle lane, hits the pins. She is equally happy because she got the outcome that was desired. Couldn't care less that it happened to bounce off a bumper. (laughs) All that matters is we got to the end the way that we wanted to get to the end. And so you can do the same kind of approach with a, with a spending rule approach in retirement. So it says, look, maybe I'm going to start by spending a little higher because if there are bumpers, like I could start a little higher. I just might hit a bad bumper that makes me caught. So maybe I'll start my spending at say 5% of my portfolio. If things go really well and my portfolio outgrows my spending, my withdrawal rate will get lower because the balance is going up more than the money that's coming out. It's like I might start at five, then it goes to 4.8, 4.5, 4.2. So if it drips under four, I hit the the, uh, conservative bumper, which says I get a raise. It's like if you start at five, but it drifts down to four, you get a 10% raise in just real dollars effective today. Your your $50,000 withdrawal goes to 55. Now we can put a bumper on the other end as well. So if your spending outpaces your portfolio, or you have a big market decline, so suddenly your spending is a bigger chunk of your portfolio. If your spending goes starts going up from 5 to 5.2 to 5.5 to 5.8, you're still within the bumpers. But if your spending rate goes over 6, you have hit the bad bumper. The bad bumper requires a 10% cut. So your $60,000 spending gets chopped down to 54. So I can't tell you which bumpers you're going to hit. Right, I do not, unfortunately, have the fully functioning crystal ball to tell you which bumpers we're going to hit in the future. But I can, in the most literal sense, give you a plan, a set of variable spending rules that says, if you hit the 4% bumper, you get a raise. If you hit the 6% bumper, you take a cut. If you stay in the 4 to 6 range, you are in the lane, and you can roll the ball straight to the end right like that. You don't need a bumper. And so I don't know which bumpers you're going to hit. I don't know if you're going to do it like my little boy and try to like curve it off a bumper and wing it into a bumper and make it bounce a couple of times there to each their own. But what I can tell you is that we put bumpers in place. So there's no gutter balls here, right? You're not going to spin so far off the tracks that you're going to run out of money. At worst, you'll hit a bad bumper more than once and have to take more than one cut. But eventually your spending will come down. But we don't have to quite do it at the extreme of like, okay, the market was up 6% this year, so you got a 6% raise. And the market's down 12% next year, you get a 12% cut. Because if you just immediately translate all spending, all market changes into spending changes, for most of us, just it's a level of spending volatility we can't really manage, right? I can't say like, Cameron, I know I told you two years ago that you could buy that dream retirement home, but the market's down so much in the pandemic that you'll have to sell it. And then I call you back two years later. I'm like, market recovered. You can buy the house back. And you go, well, I can't. Like, I sold it to someone and they like living there now. Like, I can't go get it back after a two-year temporary spending cut. I need a little bit more stability. And so the idea of, of guardrail strategies or doing bumper lanes is not just that we're setting where the bumpers are so that we don't veer too off, far off course. It's also actually so that we set the bumpers wide enough that we don't have to constantly be changing our lives and our lifestyles. We only make the adjustments when the magnitude is big enough that it actually matters. Uh, the, the third adjustment I'd give quickly as, as a, another way to think about variable spending, one of the things that we see most commonly, just, you know, I, I'm part of an advisory firm as well. I've sat across from clients for a long time. One of the things that we commonly see with people is, is, I think of it as like the tighten your belt phenomenon, or you're like times are tough right now, markets are down. I'm gonna you know cut ten or twenty percent out of my budget for the next two years until these things bounce back, and then we'll try to get back on track again. And I, you know, I certainly can appreciate that. I think it's an instinctive response for a lot of us when times are tough. We tighten our belts. the The irony though is that when you actually look at the retirement research, it doesn't help very much. You know, when we're only spending. Four or five percent of our portfolio in the first place, 
and you cut your spending by 10% of that, you're talking about a spending cut that might be 0.4% of your portfolio. So if you do that for the next two years and you shave off 0.8% of your percent of your spending, like you can make that up in one good day in the markets. Like it's just it 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 the irony is it's very impactful for us personally and actually does almost nothing to get the portfolio back on track because it's not actually high enough impact over a long period of time. The alternative that we find that actually works better. So I call those large but temporary cuts. Right? Like I'm going to take a big cut, 10 or 20% out, but we're only going to do it temporarily. What we find actually works better is not large temporary cuts, but small permanent ones. So think instead of I'm going to cut my spending by 10 or 20% for the next two years and revert it back again. Uh, I'm going to just give up my inflation adjustment over the next year. So, you know, I normally, my spending goes up by 2 or 3% a year. I'm going to give up my 2 or 3% a year raise. Now, in general, we don't think my, much of that. I mean, in practice, working with clients, we've never had someone that's like, hey, uh, you know, we live a great lifestyle with $10,000 a month, but inflation just came out and it's 2.7% a year. So please change my monthly distribution to $10,270. Right? We don't really do that. Like, we spend what's in our bank account. Now, if we work with our clients and say, we're going to adjust your spending every year for inflation, if I increase their spending distributions that's going to their account because that's our plan, they spend the money that's in their account. And if we don't increase the distribution, we spend the money that's in our account. It's pretty straightforward. But when I look at this over time, if I just trim like a 3% inflation adjustment out, not only does it mean you don't lift your spending this year, it means your baseline spending is now ever so slightly lower for every future year as well. Yes. Because if I lift your spending up, that compounds. If I don't lift your spending up, that compounds. And so if I just take out 3% inflation adjustment writ large over 30 years, the impact of that is actually five to 10 times more beneficial for your long-term retirement than doing that small but permanent cut for two years. And so the irony is it's both five to 10 times better for the longevity of your portfolio and hurts far less. Like we barely even notice the inflation adjustment that doesn't happen. 10 or 20% cut from my spending for two years. Like I'm going to notice that that's a lifestyle change. Uh, and so the third way, I think just to think about this overall, like number one is we can set it so conservatively that we're just only going to ratchet higher with good news because I don't like cuts. Option two is guardrails. Like you got to be prepared for the bad guardrail and the good guardrail, but like we can put guardrails in. I don't know which ones you're going to hit, but I know we can't veer too far off track because we got the guardrails. And, and option three is more of a, uh, you know, we'll try to lift up our spending when times are good, but we're going to trim out uh, inflation adjustments or more generally, we're going to make small but permanent adjustments when times are difficult because those actually have far more benefit than the large but temporary anyways, and they're easier to manage. So I think the the idea of bumpers is super interesting. I thought that was a great analogy from Michael. But the interesting thing about this, and we talk about this a lot with clients approaching or in retirement, is that you need to have a very refined awareness of what you need monthly for cash flow to make ends meet. And a lot of people just don't have that awareness. And to have that awareness and then how much margin around that would you want to spend if you do have great returns in your portfolio. But part of the spending that is irregular are things in your to keep your house perhaps or a new vehicle. So you really have to be aware of if you're at the lower end of your spending amount because the bumper puts you that way, what when things return to normal or your portfolio improves, do you need to allocate for the new roof on your house or your new furnace as opposed to other discretionary type spending. So I think it's it's an interesting need for people to understand exactly what spending needs they have. Right. All right. So we, we've, we've picked apart the 4% rule. We've, we've kind of explained what it is, uh, knocked it down, stripped it apart from a, a few different angles. And we, we've offered up variable spending strategies, uh, which as Professor Malevsky pointed out are, are probably more sensible than than trying to find a, a single number safe safe withdrawal rate. 
Now, to be fair to the financial independence retire early community who tend to sort of champion this rule, uh, we, we spoke to Scott Rickens, who, I, I mean, I, I think speaks at least to an extent for the early early retirement uh, community. Yeah, for uh, sure. He, he certainly uh, created a, an excellent movie about it. Uh, so he, he talked to us about how he thinks the 4% rule should be used and, and how it is used in, in practice. So one of the foundations, at least from my somewhat outside perspective, although maybe a little bit more inside after talking to you, but still outside. One of the foundations of the FIRE movement is the the 4% rule, which is this super simple idea and powerful idea that you can spend 4% of a portfolio of assets and you won't run out of money. But there are caveats. And a lot of them, you mentioned on your website that the Trinity study, which is based on 30 years of historical US data, and we've talked with us on the podcast and I've done a, a YouTube video on it as well. When you take a different data set, so keep 30 years, but go international data, choose different countries. The only countries where 4% works historically is Canada and the US. It doesn't work anywhere else. And then you extend the time period past 30 years and it's like, it doesn't work you know, anywhere, 4%. So when we're talking about, like I read on your blog or in another interview you did that your FI date, even if you're not fixated on it, is around age 44 for you and Taylor. Obviously, if you get there, 30 years isn't enough runway. So that being such an important piece of the FIRE discussion, how do you think about that yeah. So if you're a listener and you're a beginner and you're having your epiphany, stop listening to this. Fast forward like three minutes, however long it takes us <laughs> for us to talk about this, because it doesn't matter. It really <laughs> doesn't matter. That's my number one answer. If you are aware of all this and really excited to hear what I have to say, <laughs> then you're delusional. And uh, no, I think there's a lot of validity to being incredibly skeptical of all hard and fast rules, especially when they come with caveats. And I think it's something that everyone should be thinking about. And I think the 4% rule is really more of a 4% guideline. Rule is probably the wrong word. I think it's an amazing way to frame how to plan for something like retirement. In this case, retirement, I should say. And, you know, Big Earn, have you heard of Big Earn? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think he's doing like savant level work on these things. And he's incredible. And he's also a wonderful human being. And I think right now he's got a pegged around 3.25 or 3.5, somewhere in that range. Right. That's probably the safest way to go at this point where, you know, you don't have to work so long to like, let's say get to like a 2% or something that, you know, the early retirement part of this just goes by the wayside. But 3.25, 3.5%, somewhere in that range is going to be so safe that you know, you just don't really have to worry. I, for me, look, it goes like this. One, we're not just going to invest in stocks. We're going to diversify that a bit. We're going to look at some real estate. So we have, you know, some passive income or fairly passive income coming in that can help, you know, sort of buffer in times of need. We're investing in businesses so that even though we're quote unquote retired from mandatory labor, we can still enjoy, I'm still going to want to tinker and play with ideas and build things and stuff. So, you know, making that in the form of a business that can create, you know, side income is going to be important to us. And it is a safety precautionary measure kind of thing mixed with the reality of knowing ourselves and knowing that that's going to be okay with us. So, you know, what I'm really saying is early retirement is not really the goal for us. Financial independence is the goal for us. And in some cases we already sort of feel financially independent in some ways. You know, it's not independent of mandatory labor yet, but our decisions are independent of finances quite often. And that's kind of a wonderful thing. We feel more freedom because we have such a buffer now with a, you know, with a bit of an emergency fund and our net worth growing and an understanding of how all this works. We feel so much more empowered. So sorry, to get back to your question about the 4% rule, I think it's not a hard and fast rule. I think it's a guideline. I think, you know, none of us know how long we have on this planet, but, you know, and there's really no perfect plan with any of this, as you guys would contest, like any time you invest your money, there is an inherent risk in that, even with the stock market, even over 30 years, because something could happen. That's a black swan event of magnitude we've never seen before. That is possible, but it's going to happen to everyone. So that's something to consider is that like if something that apocalyptic happens, everyone's going to be feeling that because we are a global world now, you know, and so we'll assess 
at a later date and understand what it's going to take the best life we possibly can if something like that were to happen. In the meantime, you know, people who are really excited about math and geeking out about percentage points and how all that works can go right ahead and do all that work for me. And I'll take a peek at it. I'll adjust my decision making around those, <laughs> those assessments. I mean, it's a totally reasonable way to answer the question. I agree. Like the 4% rule is not useless. It's a tool that you can help you start making decisions and get in the right path. But like you say, it's a guideline. Yeah. And I would say too, I watched your YouTube video on the 4% rule. I thought it was wonderful. It was a great analysis. And it you know raised some questions for me and made me think about it a little bit more. And I would say to anyone having an epiphany today, listening to this right now, who didn't fast forward too fast, go check it out. You're doing some great work on there. I'm, I'm really impressed by it. And yeah. And it's being validated by the views and the comments and the likes and all that. So nice work. Oh, thank you. All right. So it's it's good to hear from somebody that's that's on the early retirement path, they're not using this as a as a rule. It's it's more of a more of a guideline. That's re- reassuring to hear uh, from from reading conversations online. I, I don't know if if that's always well understood, and that's definitely one of the points that we that we do want to get across. Now, w- we have picked apart the four percent rule, but we also did talk to Bill Bengen about longer withdrawal periods. We talked to him about non U.S. data, and we talked to him about other cases where, in his opinion, the four percent rule may not hold. Uh, in these clips, Bill's going to refer to the 4.5% rule, uh, which we'll, we'll, we'll address coming up in a, in a clip further down. Do you think it's appropriate for someone who happens to be able to retire younger, so they have a retirement horizon of more than 30 years, do you think it's appropriate for that kind of person to use the 4% rule in their planning? Um, you know, the uh, withdrawal rate is uh, sensitive to the time horizon. So 30 years, you get 4.5%. If you go to 40 years, I think it goes down to 4.2. And, you know, the longer you plan to live, the longer you plan to be, uh, depending on your portfolio, uh, the lower it goes. Although 4% appears to be for a tax deferred portfolio, you know, even if you live a couple hundred years uh, and the markets operate like this, I call that the Methuselah client, uh, you're going to be okay. Uh, you don't have to do much less than 4%. And, uh, you know, that's my number. Uh, my colleague, Ryan McLean, who uh, owns a company that built software that studies this issue, uh, he recently published a study with even higher withdrawal rates than I've been able to generate because he used a lot more asset classes. And he went from 4.2, which, you know, to 5.0. So uh, that's why I'm not a pessimist. I think if you have a well-diversified portfolio, Four and a half percent is more is is pretty penurious, pretty cheap. I think five five and a half percent is doable, even in this environment. You mentioned the 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 rule being sensitive to the 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 withdrawal period. If we hold that constant and just say, let's talk about a thirty year period, are there scenarios like we've talked about? prices and inflation, uh, are, are there scenarios where you would say, you know what, uh, under these circumstances, I don't think that the 4% rule does or the 4.5% rule does actually make sense anymore? Yeah. Yeah. I played around with scenarios. I wanted to see what, what would it take to break the 4% rule or 4.5% rule, whatever you have it. And I came out with one scenario that the retiree encountered uh, double digit inflation for the first 15 years of retirement. And you know, average returns, and that broke the four percent rule. That knocked it down to about three eight. That's something we've never experienced. Doesn't mean we won't. You know, that's why I say that the four percent rule is not a rule of nature. It's just a rule of thumb, you know, experiential rule. So it could change, and it's changed in the past. In past, uh, in the fifties, you know, it was not four and a half percent. It was five percent, and it came down because of that big inflationary burst in the seventies. Right. Along along similar lines, um, other researchers have since since you since you published your research, they, they've looked at the the recreating the same analysis but in different countries. So I've seen it for up to twenty three countries using the Dimson Marsh Staunton data going back to nineteen hundred, and the the safe max as you called it in your research originally of four percent only holds in I think Canada and New Zealand and the United States, but every other country in the twenty three country data set. Uh, the four percent rule does not work, and in some cases, it's really low, like like point two percent and stuff in uh, you know Italy and and Japan. Do you think people should take that survivorship bias into account when they're evaluating safe withdrawal rates? 
Well, I guess it's country sensitive. I mean, my research has had a very narrow focus. It's basically been focused on U.S. investors, U.S. investments, U.S. bonds, you know, U.S. stocks. So I'm probably not very well qualified to comment about what's happening, you know, outside our borders. But yeah, sure, I could see it could be different if they have different return profiles, different inflation profiles than we did historically. Right. Can you talk about the impact of management fees on these numbers? My research assumes that you are using funds with extremely low cost. So essentially they match their index. Uh, and obviously if you're investing in uh, funds that have or actively managed or have high fees, you, you, you're you gonna have to reduce your withdrawal rate accordingly. I think it's very important in the context of my research to use very efficient investments that uh, uh, you know reproduce indices reliably uh, and, and don't saddle you with a lot of unnecessary costs. I'm so glad we got to ask Bill about the cost. This is something that ever since I heard for the first time, the 4% rule, I wondered, are costs really included in that? And so it's nice to get him on the record about the impact of costs on your success rate. Yeah, for sure. Now, Bill talked about the 4.5% rule there, and some people's ears may have may have perked up because this episode is about the, the 4% rule. Uh, there are some interesting points that Bill makes around including other types of stocks. So in, in his original analysis, he was looking at U.S. large caps, but later he, he extended that to include small caps and it actually changed his findings. So after your 94 paper, you updated the 4% rule to a 4.5% rule. Can you talk about what went into that update? Yes. Uh, I threw in another asset class, excuse me, small cap stocks, U.S. small cap stocks. I chose them as kind of a proxy for a lot of other asset classes, one, because they had a higher rate of return than large cap stocks by about 2%. So they're adding return yep. and they didn't have a perfect correlation with large cap stocks. So they added some diversification value and that worked out pretty well. It raised, you know, uh, I think my early work indicator on 41, 42, and this brought it up to almost 4.5. So it was a pretty substantial increase in, uh, Perspective withdrawal rates will that change? Now, this this concept of adding in small caps to to market cap weights can be pushed even further, uh, which is something that we've looked at and Bill's looked at too. We, we found in our analysis that a, a fifty year safe withdrawal rate using uh, small cap value stocks, U S small cap value stocks, was three point six percent. Uh, compared to three point one percent for just U S total stock market in the historical data. We asked Bill about his findings and whether he would recommend that type of portfolio for a retiree. An extension of that idea of, of stocks from a safe withdrawal rate perspective being better than bonds uh, came up in a 2016 paper that you did or article that you did um, where you actually showed that being 100% in small cap stocks gave better results over most time periods. Now, this is something within our podcast community that comes up a lot. Um, mm -hmm. we, we know what the evidence says about small cap value stocks. Uh, we know they have higher expected returns. So a lot of the people in our community come to the logical conclusion that, well, what we should just all be in 100% small cap uh, or small cap value stocks. Why do you think, like you've done this research showing that small, small cap stocks give better safe withdrawal rates. Why would retirees not go all in on small cap stocks? Well, I, for a couple of reasons, they're a very volatile asset class. I mean, they've had years when they've been down 65, 70% and years when they've been up 150. So there's enormous range and not everybody can tolerate that kind of volatility in a portfolio. You know, the portfolio going up 50% or rising, even if you know in the back of your mind, it's gonna work out, you know, over the long term. Uh, that's true for clients. I think it's true for advisors too. You know, I think it'd be very uncomfortable for advisors to sit there and explain to your clients where your portfolio is down 50%, but don't worry about it. You know, that's really a hard story to sell. Also, if a lot of if small caps in general are a very small capitalization part of the market, and if a lot of people are tried to adopt that strategy, it'd be probably invalidated, just like the January effect. Everybody got in and, and, you know, it's no longer there because you're going to lose uh, that high return uh, effect. There's too many people are chasing those returns. Huh. That, that, that was another one of your um, 
<laughs> more recent pieces of research that I, I, I read and it was just, uh, yeah, fa fascinating. Well, yeah, I, you know, I find out that if I, in this research, that I've just got to follow where the evidence leads and not try to go ahead with preconceived notions about what I'm going to find. I had no idea what I'd find out when I started that that crazy experiment with, with small cap stocks. You know, I call it like the exports of, of investing. It's uh, going 100 percent. But for a lot of years when I, that worked, 100 percent allocation of small cap stocks did work. And it generated uh, an average withdrawal for the average investor. 13 percent was the average. And uh, one lucky investor got 25 percent. It's hard to imagine withdrawing 25 percent of your portfolio <laughs> and still having it last 30 years. But wow. that's the nature of the beast. Well, listen, we did a, a podcast episode a few months back where we looked at safe withdrawal rates for a bunch of different equity asset classes. And we found something similar. We found that the best the best safe withdrawal rate came from small cap from U.S. small cap value stocks um, in the historical data. So. It, w it wasn't necessarily a surprise to us, but it is uh, it, it is fascinating to think about. And it's hard to think about because we just talked about the behavioral reasons why you wouldn't do it. Uh, but like you said, if you if you step back from that and just think about it logically, it's it's not easy to say that uh, that you shouldn't be all in small cap value stocks. For, for the reasons that you described, I agree that people probably shouldn't do it. And I wouldn't personally do it, but th there's a bit of a cognitive dis dissonance there. Dissonance. Well, for a retiree who's in real trouble with his retirement plan, and if you encounter the right circumstances, maybe it's he, toward the end of a bear market and things are starting to look up and small caps of prospects, maybe that would be the panacea for that particular individual. It just to build his, you know, give him that extra kick to make him last 30 years or whatever he needs. So yeah. it's just a possibility. Another uh, arrow in the quiver. Okay, so it's possible that the 4% rule can be saved with a heavier loading to small cap value stocks. The other thing that Bill explained is that in his most recent research, he sorted the US data by CAPE, by cyclically adjusted price earnings, and inflation regimes to find safe withdrawal rates within those different regimes. So we've covered our thoughts on, on CAPE in, in past episodes of this podcast and its lack of, of real usefulness in making asset allocation and spending decisions. And the research that Bill's going to talk about does suffer from the same hindsight bias that, that we've talked about because it sorts time periods by CAPE ranked relative to the full historical sample of historical CAPEs. Uh, it's, it's a problem because we have no idea how that historical record compares to future CAPEs, which is what actually matters ex ante. But nonetheless, the research that Bill did on this is absolutely fascinating. You did another research update more recently, very recently in, in December 2020. And this, this I found to be fascinating. So you wrote that despite prices being high as measured by the Schiller Cape, which has Michael Kitsis found uh, prior to this, uh, tends to predict lower withdrawal rates when prices are high. So they're high now, but we also have low inflation expectations and you've found in, in your most recent research that in, un, under those conditions, the withdrawal rate could actually be higher than 4.5%, which is contrary to what a lot of people, including, <laughs> including me, have been saying because of how high prices are. Can you talk a little bit about that research? Yeah, I know a lot of my colleagues who I respect have been saying, you know, maybe it should be 3.8, maybe it should be 2.8, maybe it should be less than 1%. Uh, yeah, the, that 4.5% withdrawal rate, it is the worst case scenario historically. It's based upon the investor who retired in October of 68. And within five years, he was hit with two huge bear markets. And then after that, he was hit for 10 years of high inflation, inflation particularly damaging to investment portfolios because it forced you to increase your withdrawals. Uh, and it's a permanent increase. You know, you can't get it back like you can with markets. So, uh, I don't think today's circumstances quite match the dire, uh, you know, nature of things back in the late 60s, early 70s, even though prospective returns for assets are pretty low. Um, in fact, if you look at the picture across time, four and a half percent is the worst case. The average investor was able to take out seven, you know, if you just picked a random investor and the maximum was actually 13 percent. One lucky investor was a couple of lucky investors able to do that. 
So the four, the quoting of the 4% rule or 4.5% rule, I think unnecessarily focus people on a worst case scenario. I I think they can be probably more optimistic unless we get into a situation where PEs go to 100 or inflation, you know, comes in in a big way. That that really concerns me, inflation more than anything else. The thing that I loved about this most recent research is that you, you grouped uh, you, you grouped withdrawal experiences by CAPE ratios and inflation rates. And you, you found in the research that e- even when prices have been high like they are now, if it's been in a low inflation environment, withdrawal rates have actually not, not been so terrifyingly low. And it, that, that to me was really, uh, it was eye-opening that, that looking at both of those components, prices and inflation, can yield materially different, uh, different results. So that, that was, I, I just found that to be really, uh, really insightful research. Yeah, that kind of blew my mind, too. That was a discovery I made this summer. It only took me 27 years to find it out. <laughs> and it's funny because that's really the front end of the withdrawal process, you know, how to choose a withdrawal rate. And up to that point, uh, I didn't know how you could specify a withdrawal rate or take advantage of you know, the very high withdrawal rates uh, that occurred in the past. But for the front first time, once we throw inflation into the picture, as well as stock market valuation, which you know, Michael Kitsis had developed, uh, then you have a very, very close correlation between those two factors and what you can withdraw from your retirement portfolio. So it opens up whole new doors. Like uh, back in 2009, March, the market bottom, uh, using those tables I developed, uh, 6.5%, 7% was doable. And if you look at that investor 10 or 11 years later, he's doing great. His portfolio is up substantially despite the fact he's taken out much more than a 4.5% rate. So. Hopefully there'll be opportunities for that in the future. You know, we can go higher. Okay. So international data, longer time periods killed the 4% rule, but we may be able to revive it using tilts towards small cap value. If, if you really want to get to that 4% uh, number or, or get closer to it, low expected returns might've killed the 4% rule, but at least in the U S historical data, low inflation could more than offset that. If we continue to have low inflation, which is a, is a big question on a lot of people's minds at the no moment. Kidding. <laughs> uh, but I think that e- even the, the, the bigger point that people should be thinking about is that we shouldn't really even be having this conversation about fixed withdrawal rates because trying to withdraw a constant inflation adjusted amount from a portfolio of, of risky volatile assets is, is kind of ridiculous. And uh, again, Moshe made that point, uh, c- kind of at my expense. <laughs> well, he was uh, practically speaking, he's dead on, right? You have to have that <laughs> flexibility. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. That to me is the key takeaway from this whole discussion. I mean, the whole 4% rule, I remember when I first heard about it, it got, in my experience back when I first heard about it, it got people to reduce how much they thought they could spend. Because a lot of people were thinking, you know, I could spend 5 8%. They weren't taking into account how much mm. you had to leave in the kitty for inflation. So I think the whole notion is a good thing and brought people to something that's more reasonable in terms of expectations. Most people back then weren't thinking about protecting for inflation necessarily and weren't really appreciating the randomness. That's the good part about the 4% rule. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. If it takes people down from 8%, uh, then yeah, I, I agree. Um, I, I, I do think it, it I, I agree with what you said, and we heard Scott Rickens talk about this too, that if this is something that anchors people and allows them to think long-term and make decisions and reduce their spending and, and put money yep. into savings because it's easy to think about, that's awesome. Uh, if it's being used as a guideline like that, I still think that the number deserves careful thought. Um, it, it's it's probably not possible to narrow it down to a single number uh, to use in, in real financial planning. Uh, but if you're going to use a number uh, to help make decisions sort of as a, as a heuristic, I think it's probably lower than 4%. Uh, in, unless you're really juicing up the the small cap value, but uh, as we heard Bill talk about, that's probably not sensible for for most you better people have to good, do. Good behavior, stay committed to your factors, and it's it's probably higher than two percent. Uh, probably like I, when I've run this in Monte Carlo, which which uh, gives us a different type of insight than using historical analysis, using current relatively low expected returns. I've found around that two percent number number even for long, like very long retirement periods. Um, but you could also argue that's low because relative to the historical data, the Monte Carlo completely ignores any mean reversion. 
although we probably shouldn't bet on mean reversion happening again in the future. Um, anyway, I think somewhere between higher than higher than two probably and, and lower than 4% if somebody's going to be using a safe withdrawal estimate. And of course, it depends on other things like taxes and time horizon and asset allocation. It's also spending, right? Like a lot of people that, that we work with that are retired, they don't go and take out the whatever 2% increase every year. Often they've set it at pick a dollar amount, 5,000 a month. And here we are five or 10 years later, it's still $5,000 a month they're taking. Yeah. So I don't know if they're like Michael Kitts has talked about eliminating permanent spending on certain items. Could be that going on. Could be they're just their, their spending pattern drifts down over time, which is what Fred Vitis talked about in, in our interview with him, just a natural spending pattern that, that combats inflation as you get older. Yeah. There are so many different ways to slice it and think about this retirement income problem. And this hasn't even spoken to different uh, product allocations, like using annuities later on. Good point. Uh, yeah, I mean, there, there are so many things that goes into it. So uh, to, to, to summarize, I think as, as a guideline, like, like we've mentioned, if, if using something like this is going to help somebody who doesn't have access to sophisticated financial planning software, make quick decisions or, or, or long-term decisions. Uh, I think that's, that's great. Um, I'd maybe be using something lower than 4% though. Uh, but anyway, we, we, we hope that this, uh, consolid consolidation of, of portions of interviews with, with ex experts on this topic has helped define what the 4% rule is, uh, and provide context around when it is maybe useful, when it maybe isn't useful, how it should maybe be adjusted, and maybe even more broadly, how people should be thinking about retirement spending. Great. And with that, thanks for listening. <laughs>